I will I will begin and as always, as we should, um, thank you all for joining first and foremost because it's a busy time and we're coming out of kind of a mopey spring and it was beautiful weather. So I imagine taking a walk, going to dinner would be a good alternative, but you're here with us to learn something that's high impact. Um, I'll just say that um, in the world of wealth management, financial planning, and even in the certified financial planning curriculum, there's a growing consensus that the one thing that advisors fail to do as well as they need to in order to meet the demand of what's happening in people's lives now is to help clients better understand their health care healthcare costs throughout the remainder of their retirement. And so we want to remedy that by being a firm that can help you one-on-one -on -one and with educational information about healthcare costs and what's before you, what decisions to make. Um, so to that end, tonight we are talking about Medicare and we have with us a guest, John May, who's got that beautiful chart of Long Island Sound. And John May is a financial advisor, but also a co-owner of a thriving practice called Clinton Senior Insurance. And John is an advisor, a financial advisor in many aspects of wealth management, but he devotes most of his time, and he's welcome to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but he devotes most of his time to helping clients understand Medicare and how to navigate the different forms of coverage that would be most appropriate for you. And um, he has done many speaking tours on the subject, so we can't imagine a better educator, presenter uh, on the subject of Medicare. So I will turn it over to John. By the way, he's also a Spanish teacher. So if anybody wants to brush up on that, you'd have to work that out with him privately. But um, so I will turn it over to him. And as we, as is our custom, we'll present for 30, 35, 40 minutes, whatever it turns out to be and then open it up to questions. And also Dave will, Dave Callahan will make, uh, provide John May's phone number should any of you wanna talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. So with that in mind, John, take it over. Thank you so much, Charlie, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Ryan and Dave as well, and Riverside Financial for hosting. Um, uh, so excited to be able to provide this information and uh, and explain uh, a bit more about about Medicare uh, and a lot of hopefully clear up some misconceptions, popular misconceptions uh, people tend to have around it as well. Um, Charlie was one hundred percent right. I work a lot with people of uh, in uh, in the Medicare uh, approaching sixty five people over sixty five questions about whether or not they need to take it at sixty five. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present and uh, what I look at is the top 10 uh, questions people tend to have about Medicare. We'll cover those. Um, and as well, and then at the end, uh, if there's any questions or any other information that uh, that anybody tends to have, I'll I'll be happy to, uh, to to answer those questions as well. This is a start of this is a, it's Clinton uh, Clinton Senior Insurance. I'm in Clinton. That's a uh, that right there is a is a picture of a of. of uh, beautiful Clinton here, and move on. <laughs> and effectively, um, the basics of Medicare is getting to know it: um, costs, coverages, and choices. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna approach it. I'm thinking the bulk of the questions are gonna come towards the end of the presentation. But when I design these, I always try to put the deck together. So there's gonna be some, uh, some, uh, some interesting uh, tidbits along the way as well. The top 10 Medicare questions are over here that people tend to ask. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of them right now. Uh, you can take a look at them on the screen. Um, 
typically it's when it's starting about Medicare, people tend to, tend to confuse Medicare and Medicaid at points. Um, but as you, if there's any other questions that you see here that perhaps are not, you don't think are going to be answered anything specific, again, we can look into getting into that at the, at the end of the presentation. So the first one, to get things started, what is Medicare? Well, it begins when you receive that red, white, and blue card that you have there uh, that would have your Medicare number on it, um, as well as your start dates for parts A and B. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And some of the misconceptions about Medicare is that it's free, which it isn't. Um, important to keep in mind that it's not a family health plan. It's individual. And it's also not with Social Security either. People can elect to take Medicare uh, before taking Social Security. Um, the next step is what it's often confused with is Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is uh, is happens to be a term, a blanket term, re, re, uh, which referring to any assistance from the state. However, it's important to keep in mind that it, it ends for most people at age 65. Um, and instead, it becomes replaced with something else called a qualified Medicare beneficiary, uh, requires another application to go into the state to get approval for subsidy. Um, and they do work together, and that's called dual eligibility. And I'm going to get into that a little bit as well, because I think it's important to consider that uh, for certain situations. So who can get it? Well, you could tell you already know turning 65, you get your mailbox flooded with uh, with cards, letters, things looking very official. Um, that happens all the time. Uh, oftentimes, there tends to be phone calls. Legally, they're not allowed to cold call people for Medicare. So they get kind of creative um, in trying to do that and, uh, and and bend the rules a little bit and getting and getting phone calls. I've gotten phone calls um, here at the office, and it's funny. I pick up the phone and they ask me whether I qualify for A and B. So I humor them. I say yes, I do. Somebody else picks up and says um, and my and asks me about if I have A and B for Medicare, and I reply. I say, well, um, why did you call me? You're not supposed to be doing this. And the person gets very Oh, you called me. Is it no? Yeah, you definitely called me. And then there's a click, and that's the end of the conversation. And I, I, it's it's of course it's untraceable number, so there's not really anybody I can report it to. Um, who can get Medicare? Well, uh, citizens, legal residents, uh, people in the United States uh, living for at least five years in a row. Um, the bulk of people on Medicare are age 65 or older. Um, however, people younger than 65 with a qualifying disability are also on Medicare as well. Um, fun fact, there are over 61 million people currently receiving uh, Medicare in the United States. Um, can you have both Medicare and Medicaid together? We saw a little bit about that before, and that's called dual eligibility. Now, the important thing about this and why it how it differs from <coughs> Aid, is that this is not tied to asset. So when people think Medicaid, Medicaid is income and a large part of it is asset based as well. Areas such as Title 19, people tend to think about. This is really only based on actual income. And we'll take a look at those tables in a bit as well, um, because that's a it happens to be a program that can really mitigate a lot of cost for many people. Here's how it looks, in fact. Um, dual eligible. So uh, typically, uh, if someone is only earning Social Security or a couple on Social Security and a, and a modest pension, uh, it, over time, the cost of living increases tend to be greater than the cost of uh, how much Social Security goes up. As a result, people find themselves qualifying at various stages of their lives. And what happens is if you qualify, it's a very easy application process to get in. And basically, it's, co it's called Qualified Medicare Beneficiary, QMB is the acronym that we use. And what, what that says is um, the state would pay for Part B, as well as cover the coinsurance and co-pays that are, that are associated with uh, Medicare. So it's a very good program. And those income limits are important as well. Whether it's, uh, whether it's something that you might qualify for eventually, or perhaps know of somebody in your life that you think may qualify for it, 
to ask if they if they're taking advantage of it or not because it's a significant um, expense saver for people. Um, for everyone, Medicare Part A is no cost. Uh, essentially, most people qualify for it. And it's it, uh, Part A covers hospitalization, but I'll get into a bit more what it covers in a moment. Part B is where the cost of Medicare comes in. When you get Part B, that's when you're officially in the system, so to speak, with Medicare, receiving both benefits. And Part B is a monthly premium. It's filed, it, it goes uh, on an individual basis, and it's based on how people file their taxes. Uh, and you can see where the income limits happen to be and where those costs are as well. So for everyone who does not qualify for special assistance, it starts at 164.90 a month, and that's for this year, 2023. Funnily enough, it's down from last year. Um, there's some reasons behind it why it was lowered, but in effect, this was a year when it had a big jump from uh, from 2021 to 2022, and this is a rare time that we're actually seeing it being peeled back a little bit. And so there we have a little bit less for this year. Um, and those are how those costs work. Uh, again, whether filing individually, joint, uh, or separately on taxes. Um, you can notice that there is a cap at 560.50. So regardless of your income, if you're over, if you're an individual, if you're an individual at half a million in income or a million plus in income, uh, your Part B is going to be the, uh, the same amount. Can we go back to that chart just for sure. 30 more seconds? All right. So these are income indexed. This is your cost for Part B. And that's a pretty big jump. So one would think that managing taxable income in retirement would be kind of an important thing to make sure that your Part B monthly premium was as low as it could be without sacrificing anything else. Right. And when people initially retire, you're going to be looking at a tax returns that are really a stating an income, which are which is really no longer valid. It's, it's, it's a past income and you're paying a much higher amount. But there does happen to be reprieve. It could be appealed. Uh, there's a Social Security form that you could do. Uh, it, it's called SSA 44. And basically what that, what, that, what that does is it allows you to go ahead and to appeal where, you're, uh, where, you, where they're decided what your payment's going to be by stating that you're no longer earning this much, that here, this is my tax return. I've separated from my employer. I'm retired. Um, this is what my what my income is going to be. Here's my social security. Here's what I'm taking from my investments. So that's a, you can you so you can appeal to it. You can appeal it. You don't have to wait for it to just naturally go down, which could take a couple of years. So you do have an outlet. Okay. And by the way, can that Part B monthly premium be deducted from your social security payment? So, right, when you're taking Social Security, the Part B is deducted from it automatically. So if you're getting uh, $2,500 a month in Social Security, they'll deduct the one sixty four ninety, dollars for example, from that amount. Um, however, if you're not collecting, what happens is if you still want, let's say you're still working or you wanted to put off until age 70 uh, Social Security, but you'd like to take Medicare at 65, what happens is they bill you quarterly. So you would set up with them um, a, a plan either to have a, a, a direct withdrawal from your bank account or have them bill you, but it will be in quarterly amounts. And it's important to keep up with that payment because it's they don't typically give much leeway to people. And once you get kicked out of it, you have to go through the whole process of once again reapplying. So... A common question I get about Medicare is what happens? Can I still work? Um, yes, you can. So a, a big misconception is that you have to take it as soon as you turn 65. And that comes from a lot of those letters, those, those emails, those, those uh, everything that you kind of get bombarded with. Um, the truth is, if you are working and you are, uh, you are on a credible employer plan, um, one that includes prescription drug coverage, for example, which most do. Um, in fact, you don't have to take Medicare. 
you can float it until you decide to formally retire or leave your employer plan. You could therefore explore your options, look at your costs, see whether or not it makes sense. Um, some people might decide to keep an employer plan because there's a younger spouse that perhaps needs that coverage and they don't want to go on to, uh, they don't want to look into uh, uh, private uh, health care, individual health care on the exchange for that person. So instead, it makes more sense for that person to continue working. Um, and this is a, a, it in a nutshell. And you can delay it without a penalty. Um, curiously enough, if you do happen to separate from an employer and the employer says, well, we will give you COBRA coverage and you can have your same work plan and we'll do it for 12 months, be wary about doing that um, because they do not consider COBRA to be creditable coverage. So it's not the same as an employer-based. And you have an eight month period while collecting COBRA to in fact sign up for Medicare to avoid a penalty. So you wanna make sure that if you do decide to leave an employer, um, you sign up for Medicare when you do that. Just to So even if you wanna take COBRA, Medicare would become either the primary or secondary payer, depending on uh, the terms of the, on the employer-based plan. But then when that COBRA eventually runs out, you would be on Medicare and there won't be a penalty either. And at no point do you need to enroll or register if you're going to remain on your employer's Medicare uh, plans until you choose to potentially retire. So if you want to work to 70 and that's uh, acceptable and you're on a, a good health plan at a work, you aren't in any way sacrificing your ability to then later on get into Medicare, correct? Correct. And in okay. fact, you can you can you can get your part A, for instance, and that's not going to be a problem because there's no there's no premium with it. And part A helps with hospitalization costs. So if that becomes a another payer, um, well, then that's that could be beneficial as well to have part A along with an employer coverage plan until you decide to to, to formally leave. Let's see. So the next one, and these are these are some simple explanations. Uh, Medicare and the employer insurance work together, as, as, as I mentioned. One thing you cannot do, however, is contribute to an HSA. So if you are going to start with your uh, A and B, and you're on an employer plan, the HSA you can't contribute to any longer. You could use whatever is inside of it and spend it down, but you can no longer contribute to an HSA plan. Likewise, so if your employer plan is HSA, just know that it's not compatible. So you'd have to make that decision of whether Medicare or the, uh, or the health savings account. So what does Medicare cover? Now, this is what A covers. So uh, part A for this year, the deductible is around $1,600. So there's a $1,600 deductible associated with part A, uh, which would entitle you to 60 days in the hospital. After which point it would go to uh, $400 a day uh, copay you would have from day 60 through 90. So if you think about it, it is a much lower deductible than many employer plans happen to offer at 1600. And here's what it covers: everything from hospital rooms and meals, skilled nursing, nursing services, um, prescription drugs and medical supplies, lab tests, operating room, um, skilled care, rehabilitation. So it really covers um, everything that's associated with being in a hospital. Um, the nice, go ahead. Sorry, my phone. So you really don't have those, uh, some of those issues, like some of those surprise bills, like I'm sure uh, a, a good portion of us from various employer plans over the years might've had something like, oh, wait a second, the anesthesiologist wasn't in network and here's a bill for $12,000 for something. Um, so you don't have that. It's so you're, you're, it, does, it does protect you on that side. Uh, fast facts, uh, it's uh, premium free, which is the part A. And that's, as, as I mentioned before, you can't be denied coverage. It's nationwide, so you're not working in a hospital. There's no network. So currently, if you're uh, an employer plan, you're working with a major insurance carrier, uh, there's no network associated with this. So if someone says that there's a specialist in Boston or in New York they'd like you to see and you're in Connecticut, you could do that. And as long as they accept Medicare, um, you're not going to have to worry about any being denied coverage or going through any red tape. Uh, part B is everything else. 
So doctor's visits, outpatient. Uh, physical therapy tends to be a big one here that, that's, that's covered here as well. Um, you have your wellness screenings, uh, mental health care, durable medical equipment, uh, things, even uh, walkers, wheelchairs, CPAP machines, um, x-rays, um, ambulatory surgery. So basically, if the doctor says you need to have something done, and uh, you can have it done. And if it's something, for instance, related to the eye, if there's, if there's cataract surgery, well, that's surgery, it's prescribed, it's a medical condition. So it falls into the realm of Part B. Now, Part B happens to come at a cost of 20% coinsurance. So it's 20% of whatever the Medicare agreed upon cost is. Um, there also is not a ceiling with that 20% either. And by that, I mean, uh, you're not going to reach a point of that 20% out of pocket in which they're going to say, well, oh, hey, you've spent too much. You're now covered 100%. So that is something to keep in mind as, as we go through the conversation. I mean, that could be a big nut. Yes, it could. Uh, yes, it could. So a couple of things about it, much like part A, it's everywhere in the United States, uh, effectively that, uh, that accepts Medicare. Uh, that monthly premium, which we looked at earlier, which is the income related uh, monthly premium. Um, again, it's coverage is nationwide. And there is that penalty that we discussed as well. And it says, unless you qualify for special enrollment period, and that's what the that's what leaving a, an, an employer plan is. It's a special enrollment period. So you could be 68, you could be 82. I had a gentleman here who was 82 years old and he was just retiring, uh, but he had creditable coverage from his employer. Um, so for him, it was just <laughs> deciding when he wanted to start it and starting the following month. Um, and here's a little bit of what it doesn't cover. Um, some of the bigger, bigger ticket items are things like prescription drugs. So when you get Medicare A and B, you're required to carry a prescription drug, also known as Part D coverage. You've probably heard of Part D. It's, it's also one of these uh, many different uh, uh, parts that are, that are bandied about on television. So Part D is prescription drug pump. So if you were gonna, if you were gonna have original Medicare, you would have to get a prescription drug plan as well, and those vary in in monthly cost. Those, like uh, your Medicare Part B, are also taken out of Social Security. So if you're collecting your if if you're collecting Social Security, your Part D plan premium would come out of it. Your Part B would come out of it, and by and large, for most people. A lot of the medications that tend to be the ones that are more popularly prescribed, often going, they, what Medicare does is they tier them. So tiers one to two are medications that have been around forever and seemingly everybody is on, and those come at little to no cost for, for most people. And then the structures change between medications that are uh, some of the more uh, popular brand names as they come out or drugs that are less frequently taken. Um, drugs such as uh, cancer medications fall under the Part B side of things, not the Part D. So that will be covered under the other, the other facet. Um, it also doesn't cover things such as dental, vision, or hearing care. The key word there is routine. So if, again, you happen to go to the doctor because you have, you have an infection in your jaw from something and you go to the hospital, that's covered. If you want to have a root canal done, that isn't covered, all right? So there are certain things that it does and doesn't do. Um, eyeglasses fall in the same way, um, hearing aids. Um, and so those are areas that are left out. And again, there are very, very big areas that are, that, are, that are left out as well. So where can you get more coverage? So we've gone over what original Medicare looks like. You have that red, white, and blue card. You have the A for the hospitals. The B for the outpatient. You've gone ahead. You've got the Part D for prescription drugs. And you're thinking, okay, I know if I go to the hospital, I have a sixteen hundred dollar deductible. I know if I go to the doctor, I'm responsible for twenty percent of that bill. Um, so what options do I have? And plus, I don't have dental. I don't have anything else covered. What do What do I have to do? So here's what that looks like. So the option one is that Part D plan, as we mentioned, the prescription drugs and getting something called Medicare Supplement Insurance or Medigap. Um, now, those are offered by insurance companies, but it is not insurance. 
The important thing to keep in mind about Medicare supplement plans is that they are the payer. So all the insurance company is doing is paying that 20% on the Part B and paying that $1,600 deductible on the Part A. And it comes at a premium. Now, that's all it does. So you don't have to coordinate with uh, insurance company X, Y, or Z. If you want to go to a, that hospital in Boston or New York, um, you could still do that. So you're not they're not managing your health care. Um, Medicare supplement insurance, however, is only that. Uh, it doesn't cover things such as it's not vision insurance, dental insurance. That's not in there. Um, so it's pretty much just bare bones medical insurance is what it is. It's that payer and it covers those things. The other side of the coin is Medicare Advantage. Now that gets the that gets the name Part C as we as we have here. I like to think of Part C as companies or insurance companies. Um, Part D for drugs, Part C companies. So. This is uh, the side of the coin where private insurance carriers petition Medicare to be able to provide coverage for people that are 65 and older. So what Medicare does is me uh, Medicare has created a system with Medicare Advantage in which they approve of plans offered by private insurers. And once getting that approval, they're able to offer them in, in, in different states. And what they tend to do is come at with a bundle, uh, the coverage. So what they say they're gonna do is, hey, we'll cover hospital, we'll cover outpatient, but we're also gonna do some additional things. We'll give some degree of, of dental and vision coverage. Uh, we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll, give, we'll give coverage if people wanna go to a gym. Uh, we'll give coverage for a chiropractor, for a podiatrist. So they started to, mo to mimic these off of a lot of the employer plans, which makes sense considering Many of these carriers also offer employer-based plans, and many people are accustomed to that. So it's it's uh, it's it's the bundle of all these different things together. Um, so if you notice here, it, it talks about the extra benefits, and it's offered by the private insurance companies, and many of those come at a zero dollar premium, meaning that there's no additional charge. So uh, the question I most frequently asked, and I guess I'll preempt this one, is. Why are they doing all of this for free? It can't be free. And no, it isn't. Um, Medicare uh, itself, CMS, is paying uh, the each insurance carrier uh, a stipend every month for every person that signs up with them. So that, in effect, is a backdoor of them receiving premium from you. So you're not actually paying them. You're still paying that $164 a month for Part B. You take a Medicare Advantage plan. You're not getting a bill for it, or actually you will get a bill, but it's going to be for zero. And they're getting their premium from Medicare. Safe to say that it's an outsourcing of Medicare too. Yes, because going into that big number of 61 million people plus and growing, um, it's a lot for the government to manage. If you, if, if you think about it, it's a, it's a huge system. So basically what it's doing, it's offering that assistance by removing people from, uh, from, uh, from, that, from that healthcare to a Medicare Advantage. The important thing to remember is that it is an alternative to Medicare. So you're not that red, white, and blue card. If you elect or choose to have a Medicare Advantage plan, that can go in the top drawer, the safety deposit box, uh, and, and, and the files forever because you're not going to be using it. You're going to be using instead the card from the Medicare Advantage plan. So it's it's a different way of coordinating. So this goes into, I, I briefly went over these and that that's what they offer again, uh, the Medicare Advantage side of things. Um, so here's the Part D coverage. So for people that elect for original Medicare or original Medicare with a supplement plan, they do have to have a Part D. And Part D is either on, it come with a standalone plan here or it can be bundled in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, so again, the standalone does come with a premium. Inside of a Medicare Advantage, it does not. And a little bit here about the uh, Medicare supplemental plan, also known as Medigap. As, as, as I explained, it, it, it attaches and there's really, for most people, there's really only two plans. There's going to be G or N. Um, for people that turn 65 prior to 2020, there's also the plan F as well. And 
what these what these plans tend to do is uh, the difference between uh, them tends to be premium cost depending on the carrier, but it's stacked with N being the least expensive um, at, at, at about one hundred and seventy to one hundred ninety dollars depending on the carrier. Then it goes up to uh, to Plan G, which is the next tier, which is about thirty to forty dollars more. And then there's Plan F, which could be upwards of hundred dollars more than Plan N. Um, Plan N, if you elect to have that one, which is the least expensive, there's some out of pocket. You know, the that out of that 20%, you would have about a $20 copay when going to a doctor or a specialist. Um, and you would have $165 or so, um, excuse me, a $230 um, Part B deductible every year you would have to pay. So it has a little bit out of pocket cost associated. Plan G, no $20 for visiting the doctor. However, you still have that $200 uh, deductible. Plan F, uh, no deductible cost and no, uh, and no charge for going to a, uh, to a doctor or a specialist. So you can plug and play according to budget and what you believe would be the frequency of, you know, of visitation and what your medical. Right. Is. And there tends to be, uh, there tends to be a misconception about Part F being the uh, a Rolls Royce of these plans, and it's no longer offered. The truth is, is that if you, based on even what I just, I, I just explained, the one perk is really not having the deductible and not having that twenty dollars to visit the doctor. But at a hundred dollars or so a month more, it's it's uh, financially speaking, it, it's it's tough to justify. All of these plans, however, they do the same thing regardless of carrier. So there's a lot of carriers out there. Costs do vary based on where you live. Um, and it's important to always review those costs because again, a plan N, whether it's with Anthem, Connecticut, United Healthcare, uh, Aetna, whomever, it's all gonna do the same thing. So that's the, so with that in mind, again, you're just picking a, a, picking a payer and those costs vary greatly sometimes between between plans, depending on how popular that payer is in the state. Um, the state of Connecticut, by the way, one other thing to add on to this is something called a guaranteed issue state, meaning there's no medical underwriting involved. Um, now, over here, they're saying for six months after rolling in Connecticut, it is like that always. So let's look at a situation. Imagine you are on a Medicare Advantage plan and you have you have a very bad health year and you have you have costs. Now they're mitigated, but there's still costs. And those costs can perhaps go on for several years. Well, you might look at it and you might uh, look at it and think, well, financially it might make more sense to go to a Medicare supplement plan. Well, you can do that. So there are times of the year you can go ahead, you can drop it, you can pick up a supplement plan, pick up a part D. Um, and then you don't you don't have to worry about again uh, uh, having to go through an insurance provider to to approve pre approval. Um, you can go to specialists. You can and your out of pocket expense will be mitigated in a case like that. So how much does Medicare cost? Um, again, Medicare Advantage plans starting off there on the far left. It's a uh, low to zero monthly premiums. Um, some of them do have a deductible, a very modest deductible to the tune of a couple hundred to uh, either zero to a couple hundred to a thousand at most, uh, copay and coinsurances. Um, and those again are, are, are in the modest range. The Part D prescription drug plan, monthly premium. Um, the less expensive ones have a deductible, the more expensive ones do not. So it's on your appetite for paying a deductible. Uh, and also have copay and coinsurance, and the supplement plans uh, have a premium. And as I mentioned, they have a scale in terms of deductible and copays. With F being the only one that erased both the deductible and the copays, but for people turning 65 after 2020, they're unable to get that. Uh, so it's uh, it's going to be the the uh, the plan N or the plan G. At the bottom, it mentions they have the uh, Medicare Advantage plans have an annual out of pocket maximum. So as I, as I alluded to earlier, that there is some out of pocket, it could be a couple hundred dollars per day in the hospital, could be $45 to visit, visit a specialist, for example, maybe it's 75 to get x-rays done. Uh, things And what happens is there's a ledger 
uh, with the insurance company. So all those expenses add up. And then when it reaches a certain point, um, typically anywhere depending on the plan from on average about $6,500 to $7,000, um, everything's covered 100% from the Medicare Advantage uh, company after that. So, so there is a ceiling. So in other words, unlike original Medicare without a supplement where there's no ceiling, this gives you a ceiling, the two-year out-of-pocket expenses. So how do you choose? Well, the first step is enrolling in Original Medicare. Um, that one can, you can do several different ways. Uh, it can go online by going to uh, socialsecurity.gov. Um, that's certainly something that uh, uh, when, when people come in, I help guide them through a little bit of that process and enrolling in Original Medicare. Um, it used to be very easy. It used to be faxing papers in until we started following up and realizing that, well, these offices are greatly understaffed and they getting things in on fax, well, it might take them a while to actually get it into the system. So the wait time was so much, it made it easier to do going online and actually going in person. And the uh, here are your different options as well. So after step two, you see the card, and then your option one is going with a Medicare Part D plan and a supplement, or going with a Part C company corporate plan, so to speak, where you'd have everything bundled together. And there are some considerations between the two plans. Um, the Medigap plan, again, is the one that, that is all is the bill payer for, for original Medicare. Uh, it doesn't call it, it's only that, however. So other things you have to plan for, uh, whether that be if dental was an area that was important, you'd have to get a standalone dental plan. They do bundle dental and vision together. So you have to have that. So you'd look at having your uh, Medigap plan, you would have a Part D plan, you would have a, um, a vision and dental plan as well. So that way you would have all the, uh, you basically have all your different insurances right there. Um, the Medicare Advantage, much like an employer plan, they look to bundle things together. And as I mentioned, some of them offer, they offer uh, something. So maybe a modest dental or vision, but they do allow the ability to actually for a, again, for a small premium, uh, beef it up, so to speak, to get increased coverage in those different areas. Uh, when can you enroll? So quite frankly, um, three months before you, the month you turn 65 is when you can start the process with social security and it extends to three months after. Um, that's for the initial, initial enrollment period. However, if you're working and you have a good employer plan that you don't want to leave uh, for various reasons, um, then you don't necessarily, you don't have to do this. Uh, so you can just, you can delay it. And we'll get onto that on the next page and what that looks like. Oh, um, well, first, let's take a look at late enrollment penalties. So if you were, at, let's say, 65, you didn't have a plan, you didn't sign up, um, then you would have you would have some penalties here with Medicare Part B um, being the most expensive uh, because that's the one there that is a 10% of the Part B premium amount for each full 12 month period. Uh, so that can be expensive if people wait a few years. Um, I only had one case where I had somebody that had many years uh, without it, and the gentleman was fortunate enough to be in good health. Unfortunately enough, that he thought his previous employer had filed it for him. Uh, when he retired. And so he was looking at 10 years worth of penalty that I had him submit some information to appeal it. Um, but again, with that, that was denied. So that would be a substantially more expensive uh, Part B premium. So when can you change your coverage? So the annual enrollment period is one that begins uh, October 15th to December 7th. That's when they amp things up with uh, on, on television and so on, where you see all the, uh, you can't watch a news program or pretty much anything without Joe Namath or, uh, or Jimmy J.J. Walker or somebody um, vying for your attention and telling you that you're owed something and call now to see what you're owed. Advice, do not do that. Uh, talk to talk to a broker first. Um, what they do is they do fill people out to call centers, and that does. And you're not necessarily going to be put in a plan that is the best one in your area or suitable for you. So that's October 15th and December 7th. 
So let's say you, you're, you're already in Medicare, you have a plan, you love your plan, well, you don't have to do anything. You just let, they will send you uh, whatever plan adjustments or changes are uh, in the fall. You can read that letter. It's called the annual notice of change. And if there's nothing there that's raising any bells, or if anything, it looks like things have improved, you just let it go and it'll automatically uh, re-enroll for you. So January 1, the new plan with the different with the with the adjusted benefits, if there are any, would start for you. Um, however, if you don't like your plan, this is a way in which you can at least explore other plans, see if something happens to work, and you can change it then. Also, and this is really important, especially if you have a Medicare supplement plan, if you're someone that has a supplement in the Part D, that's the only time of the year that you can review your medications for the following year to see if you are in the right plan. Those plans, I notice, are a lot more volatile. So when it comes to it, those Part, those part D plans, sometimes I see premiums go up significantly, um, I see I see plans drop out of nowhere and people are automatically enrolled into something else. Um, likewise, if you happen to get a prescription during the year, um, which is maybe significant or at least you notice that you're paying more, it's a good time to actually review it. Then that's the only time you have. The next period is the one that's not advertised which is um, you have a chance to change once between January to March 1st. So the hypothetical situation I looked at earlier, you have a Medicare Advantage plan, you like it, you looked at changes, you think, okay, I'll see how the changes go. January happens, then you talk to someone and say, say hey, you know what? My plan is really terrific. Oh, what plan do you have? You say, okay, you have this conversation. Well, you can actually do one single change. So if you can change your, you can change your plan once, between January uh, to the end of March as well. So the first quarter of the year. Um, so you happen to have that as well. Now, if you drop Medicare Advantage plan during that time of the year, and this is where point number three looks, you can enroll in a supplement plan as well, uh, and you can, get a you can get a Part D then too, but that's the only time you can do that. So you can't change your Part Ds, but if you were going new into a Medicare supplement plan, then you can add a Part D. And again, I apologize. I'm throwing so much information at you at the moment. But again, there's a lot, there's just a lot that happens to be within this universe of Medicare. And finally, for people that are retiring, um, these are, here you have, or you have your special enrollment period. So it could be you're leaving your employer. That's a common one. You're moving, and perhaps you're, you're changing areas. So um, let's say you're leaving Middlesex County and moving to New Haven. You would say, well, okay, um, does my plan, is it the same plan that I have? Well, you can look, most chances are it's going to be yes, but it might not be. Um, typically, the satellite areas tend to, I noticed New Haven and Middlesex counties gel mostly with what plans offer. Fairfield, things get a little bit different. And of course, if you leave the state, you also, uh, you would have a special enrollment period. In which case you would uh, you would look to change plans then too. A word of advice: if you uh, haven't enrolled in a supplement plan and you were interested in one, let's say your Medicare Advantage and you're going to retire in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, uh, Maine, wherever, um, being a guaranteed issue state, take advantage of it. Enroll in a supplement plan here in Connecticut. It's portable. You can take it with you. And the nice part is is that. The, your premium will adjust for the state you move to. So you won't have to have the underwriting. And so you can go in and chances are the premium is going to be lower in a state that's not Connecticut. <laughs> How can I save money? All right. So it's, it, uh, let's go. Uh, the title is, is talking about uh, ways in which if you're on Medicare, that you can be looking at saving money. And I've actually, uh, one of them, uh, one of these points we're gonna get to is one that I see most frequently. All right, the one I see most frequently is point number three about generic and low tier prescription drugs. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, well, there's a lot of money that's generated there. 
And I know that with the uh, with the passing of the Secure Act, there are more medications that are being covered. Uh, diabetes medications being capped at thirty five dollars. Um, so there are there are certainly uh, good things that are happening, but in my opinion, not enough. Um, so I think it's important when changing from an employer plan, if you happen to have prescription drugs that are, let's say, a brand name, and you take a look, you, you meet with somebody to go over uh, prescription medications, and you look at all the different plans that are out there and think, wow, that's still expensive. Um, well, there might be a generic available that your doctor can try you on that would work. A lot of times, uh, Medicare Advantage plans uh, and Part D plans uh, even have some suggestions that you could ask your doctor about. Um, and finally, you can also petition the actual drug company itself for some assistance as well. Um, that actually happens more common than you'd think. I do have that with people that look at it and think, wow, this thing is just not covered well at all. What do I do? Um, typically, there is something that is, uh, that is a, uh, a, a coverage change that your doctor can fill out. It's a very common form that, that doctor's offices in which they look to either do a tiering change on the drug in which it goes from a very high tier to a middle tier. So in other words, something that is very expensive, a lot of out-of-pocket to something that perhaps fits uh, more politely within a budget, so to speak. Um, but that's something that you would talk to with a doctor and uh, and discuss. But, you know, I wish to say it was, a, it was easier you know, you didn't have to do that, but I almost look at it as if those chances, those upper, those times when you call up the uh, the cable company and say, "I'm switching," there's something else that's cheaper, and they come back, oh, 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 wait a second, how about we do this? I hate the whole jumping through hoops process, but unfortunately, sometimes we uh, we have to do it, even with something like prescription medications. So, where can you go for help? Um, Medicare.gov is a terrific resource. That's there. Um, there's in the state Medicaid office, 800 Medicare uh, as well. Are all uh, these are all different areas that provide assistance for people. And effectively, by doing that, you can find additional information. In my line of work, what I do is, if somebody comes in and we have we have a conversation about, let's say, uh, income, a common thing I would do is, is fill out for someone, for instance, the uh, uh, the applications with the uh, Department of Social Services so that they would qualify. Again, if they come in from those income limits, or give general help on how somebody can sign up for Medicare as well. All right. So, John, you're open to some questions from yes, the I audience. Am. Fire away if anybody has anything to ask John. And we will, you know, clearly he's a pro at this. So, if anybody wants to speak to them indiv in, to him individually and sort of customize what they're looking for, you're Welcome to do that. Dave will provide your number, but fire away if you have any questions. I have a question. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see me here. Um, I've had some friends that had recent situations where their parents went in nursing homes and they came out of the experience saying that the amount they showed in their bank accounts hurt them as far as what they paid in nursing home costs. And they didn't have millions and millions, but they had say a million. I mean, they had good amounts of money, but it was gonna be very expensive long-term care. So they didn't do any planning. They didn't do any strategizing. And I wonder ethically, is there a right way to have a decent amount in trusts? I mean, and I've never looked into this at all, but a decent amount in trusts or something where you do get to use Medicare or Medicaid, but uh, again, ethically, because I mean, you do technically have a lot of the money and I don't, th these people regretted that they did not plan basically. Yeah. And you bring up a very good point. Um, so this is again, health insurance, the optimum, the, the key word is health. So it doesn't extend to long-term care instances, uh, like you, like, uh, like you described. Um, so effectively all of this is based on the prospect of getting better. Uh, and, it reaches a point. So if you have original, if you have original Medicare with the supplement plan, you have 365 days, which sounds like a lot, but it's, it's, it's not when you're facing a long-term care situation, that can be years. Um, so the problem then becomes, well, you have people that, uh, that have assets and they have to spend them. They're spending them at these facilities, which are very expensive. 
And the government says, well, we'll step in once you're destitute, um, once you reach, once your income has gone away. So you did bring up a terrific point, you know, as far as uh, as far as the uh, the estate planning side of things, um, to go ahead to find ways in which people can uh, quote unquote game plan for that situation, to have a plan in place for that break glass situation. There there are ways that people can work to avoid that situation, but it requires that foresight and planning uh, to go into it, um, which yeah, it's a do. A very personalized thing, Bob, and we could talk about it. it. Medicaid, it's talking really about a Medicaid trust in which you transfer your assets into an irrevocable, illiquid trust to then appear to be impoverished so that Medicaid would kick in. But they have long look back periods, 60 month look back periods that you'd have to claw back if you were trying to initiate benefits within that look back period, and then the money becomes very rigid and you might regret putting money into an irrevocable Medicaid trust just to accelerate the time that Medicaid might pick up the tab. So very difficult planning, it has to be nimble, but we can talk about that offline because it's not directly related to Medicare per se, so. So uh, I have a question, another Bob. Um, <laughs> so. In our particular situation, my wife is retired, but retired as a teacher, which gives her continued access to the school uh, health care program. And so we're actually both on that now because I'm self-employed. Uh, so it's the best. That would probably count as one of these um, certified insurance plans, correct? So, and and the challenge is she's, well, she's gonna, she's much older. She's turned 65 before me. So uh, anyway, um, uh, so we would be more apt to be under that concept that as long as she's eligible for that plan through the town, it may be the more competitive option. Yes. So those plans, uh, they vary town to town. Uh, sometimes they do change them on you. But to give you an idea, the nice part about what they do with some of those plans is there is a premium involved with them. However, in exchange, uh, that maximum out-of-pocket cost is greatly reduced. It might be $2,000 before everything kicks in 100%. So you would be spending less than you... Uh, well, you'd be spending about the same as you would on a Medicare supplement plan uh, in, the, in terms of cost of premium combined with your maximum out of pocket costs. So yes, uh, uh, they they do provide a very good coverage in that sense. So so strategically, we'd want to look at probably, you know, what does a Medicare Advantage plan look like in terms of overall costs compared to staying on the program that we're on? And right. Well, if she's if she's sixty five and she's currently on a plan, uh, she. Um, she should be on one of their oh i see because you because you're working she hasn't left yet okay yes so those plans are the ones that uh, that are the modified medicare advantage plans like i just described um and they tend to be very good um yes there's a premium to them but it's not much um, and she's she's not 65 yet but will be this year and before me so that but that's good so not not having to change but also because of the special um, exemption thing, we can sort of cross the bridge whenever we want. Um, exactly. Uh, this, this, I didn't quite catch from your, um, your open enrollment times. If you're coming off a special exemption, you, you would, you have to do that during the open enrollment time? No. So That's a special, a special election period is any time during the year. So okay. if, um, so the way to time it would be when both of you are 65. So is she's, I take it she's going to keep working past 65? No, she's actually retired, but she oh, can okay. have the insurance as part of her retirement benefit. Okay. So in a case like that, you know, it's, uh, you would, uh, you would have to, uh, if she elects to have the Social Security, uh, the Medicare side coverage, that would be that you would be able to do that as well once you're 65, but you'd have that gap between uh you, between turning 65 so that's the only thing you have to be aware of if, if yeah. you were to do that you have to go on the exchange yeah so 
uh, likely we would stay put until I'm also 65. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're good plans. Yeah. Thanks, John. You're welcome. I, I'd like to just point out that I think it's really important to, you know, to recognize that if, if you're getting, you know, cheap premiums or no premiums on an advantage plan, you have to look at the whole and include the coinsurance and include the deductibles to kind of get some sense as to total liability and to plan for that. And the other issue is also given that Part B premiums are income indexed, that that takes some planning too, just to make sure, you know, maybe you lean on Roth accounts, maybe you have tax-free income instead of taxable and do all you can to get your reportable income as low as possible. And that has the positive ripple effect of keeping your Part B premiums down. So there's a lot in here. I, I think it, it goes back to individual planning and, you know, I'm a certified financial planner, but it's just one of these approaches that covers everything somewhat broadly. And this is an area in which you need expert help. So um, just like you would at looking at social security options. So we, we can't necessarily devote all our time to learning every nuance of Medicaid, but we could Medicare, but we could find the people who do and John is one of them. So we really appreciate him doing this for us and spending his time. So any other questions for John? Otherwise we'll wrap up and do everything offline or individually. And again, Dave, providing people John's number if you wanna reach out to him privately. Any other questions? Just another thank you. Yeah. Very well presented. You're, well, you're welcome. Of... Thanks to all of you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks, John. John. Thank you. We'll probably be reaching out to you. <laughs> we have more questions okay. and answers. So thank you. That's not Certainly. one of the paintings, is it? Your the the painting at your lime show oh. is just awesome. I had just been yeah. there. Oh, oh, is that right? Thank you. I, thank you. My yeah. Mother took, my mother took me. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. great. Well done. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you John. Take Great care. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you.